But at the end of the day, it starts with the hiring manager and it ends with the hiring manager. I'll give you another question here, right? Should I prepare for my interview with the hiring manager the same way I prepare for interviewing with the recruiter? No, definitely not. They're seeking different information. Perfect. So Welcome, 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 welcome to this episode of the How to Get a Job podcast. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a treat for you today. We have Alan Stein. He is a former big tech executive turned career coach, and he left his half a million dollar job a year to help you land half a million dollar jobs. And so that is why you should listen today, because we're going to talk about how you can break into big tech coming from a hiring manager's perspective, from the person that was making the decision on who joins his team or not. Alan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Daniel. And I don't know how much coffee you have, but I need to get another uh, cup because you got so much energy here. I, I, I got to you know, raise Alan, my bar. I, I, I don't know if it's the coffee, even though I am drinking my third cup of coffee today. Um, I This is my favorite part about my job. I think it is podcasting teaching and leading everything else. I'm not like it's, it's part of it feels like a job. This does not feel like a job. Like the ability, like you're telling me that I'm able to do this where I can interview some amazing individuals and use that information, that coffee chat, right. And make it public so that others can learn from it. Um, and I learn from it at the same time. And then I get to meet people and build relationships. Like I, I don't, I don't see something else that makes me happier to be honest with you. It's not too bad. And I don't mind talking. So we're both perfect, happy. Perfect. So look, Alan, super interesting. I came across your LinkedIn and I found it extremely, extremely fascinating um, that you make the, that you made the jump, right? Because um, I interview career coaches all the time and a, lot, and a lot of them come from a recruiter HR background. And I, similar to you, I came from a hiring manager's standpoint. Now, you, on the other hand, have amazing experience on working like Salesforce, uh, Facebook, um, you name it. I, I even think I saw Google back somewhere around there, um, everywhere. Um, so tell us a little bit, like, first of all, why'd you leave careers that people would die to have to be coming now helping others as a career coach? Yeah, great question, Daniel. Well, partly they didn't want me there. So I've had... 29 jobs in my life. I've worked for 21 different companies, including what you said, Google, Facebook, Salesforce, also American Express, UBS. I worked in baseball. I worked in venture capital. I worked in finance. Um, I worked at Kraft before it was called Bondelis. I only left 24 of those jobs on my own. Five times I got fired, including probably five out of the last 10 jobs. And mostly because I am not someone who sits idly by and I'm not a, a good person who deals with hypocrisy and BS and politics. So um, it just doesn't sit well with me and it doesn't sit well with my career. Um, so, yeah. And when I look back on my career of what I have done in terms of leading people, and as you say, I was a hiring manager. I was not a recruiter but I was always very involved in the recruiting process. I would always raise my hand to go on campus with diversity efforts, with campus efforts, with all different sort of recruiting efforts. Um, I just geek out over it. I, I've taken interviews for fun. I have, like, I've always been tagged by people to interview as part of panels. So it's when I've thought about my frustration with the corporate world. And we can yeah. talk a little bit about that. There's lots of positives about the corporate world. And I thought about what I really enjoyed about growing, developing careers. That was a hell of a lot more appealing. And I figured that um, I can't get fired anymore. Well, I guess my yeah. clients can fire me, which very few, very few do, fortunately. But, um, but yeah, it's like I, I've been in the corporate world for 26 or 27 years. I wasn't getting any more value out of it. Yeah, it's it's super interesting um, because I also rough some feathers at PepsiCo I, 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 because of, you know, not necessarily playing the corporate game, right? And, um, and, and I think that's a big reason why I also kind of like made the jump of like saying like, hey, like um, I want to be able to have uh, 
you're always going to have a boss, right? Like in, 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 in our scenario, our boss, our clients, our people who are voting with their dollars, right? And people who are voting with their attention. Um, but, but I do think, you know, um, it still speaks volume of you to be able to have had such successful careers because like, it's no, like I even look at the time you spent at Google, like five, five and a half years, American Express, six years, like that's a long time in the amount of promotion. So you're definitely doing a lot of things right. And you don't get to a manager, director, or even vice president level because of luck. Like there's a level of you being able to have hitting your KPIs to be able to do that. And you must have hired hundreds, if not thousands of people during that time frame. And I think that if you're just starting out, you assume the recruiters have the power and you will realize that they are they're they're briefly in that process. Like, you know, as the hiring manager, you realize there's a need. Either someone on your team got promoted or someone on your team left or you're adding headcount. Generally, it's one of those three reasons, like you're adding headcount because the department's growing. That's when maybe you bring in the recruiter and they do some of the heavy lifting but at the end of the day, it starts with the hiring manager and it ends with the hiring manager. And for all those people that like are looking for a job and are networking with recruiters, I always say the best person to, re- to network with, number one is the hiring manager. Number two is people on the team that report to the hiring manager, so your future coworkers, because I even think they have more, more influence on the hiring manager than the recruiter does. And then third, I would say then say the recruiter. But tell me more about your perspective on that. I, I think that's an interesting take. The one person I would put in higher than the hiring manager and the people on the team are the people above the hiring manager. So if you can influence my boss and that then my boss can influence me as a hiring manager, that's going to carry a lot of weight. So no, I was going to put, yeah. I was going to talk to you about that. You say your manager would have more influence over you than you yourself, knowing that my experience for it personally and from my conversations with others, especially when you get to a higher level, your manager doesn't pick your team because it's your KPIs are on you. It's like, how can I expect you to deliver if I don't let you pick your team? You, you would think that, but when I was um, a director at, yeah. I, I won't name the company, but one of the companies I worked at, I got a request from our CRO, our chief revenue officer, to interview this woman for my team. I was leading a global technical support a team that was required technical acumen, communication, uh, strong knowledge of the software we were working on. He met someone, I believe, at some country club, and he wanted me to interview the hostess at this country club for a role on my team. And it came down from the CRO. So what do you think I did? I interviewed that uh, that woman from the country club. I ultimately did not decide on her because she was such a poor fit. She, she was a nice woman. She was not a good fit for that role. But something coming down from the CRO, I had to spend 30 minutes of my time with this hostess for a job that she was eminently not qualified for. Um, she was qualified for lots of jobs, not yeah. a job on but, my but team. But then that, again, I think that a referral from a high, from your boss will definitely guarantee the interview, but it doesn't guarantee the hiring, right? And at the end, that networking with the hiring manager like yourself, even though I'm networking with you, it's not an official interview. It's still an interview. I'm still making a good impression or a bad impression. And that's influencing the decision that you ultimately make when I do go to the interview. And and you're judging me not just on the 30 minutes that we interview. You're judging me on the whole conversation we've had. That, that's a good point. And mo- I would say 95 to probably 95% of the time where I hired someone, I was the ultimate decision maker. But there are times when there's influence yeah. from above when I've worked with micromanagers. So not yeah. the CRO, but a manager above me, manager two levels above me have had significant influence, less so with me because yeah. I pushed back and it didn't necessarily end well. But I've seen that with other people where someone above them is essentially playing puppet master to that hiring manager and building yeah, that team. No, out. absolutely. I, I definitely can see that. In a, in a... But, but generally speaking, 95% of the time, I agree. Hiring manager, number one, the team is probably eminently important, but also if you get yeah. a level above yeah. to, to, to put the thumb yeah. on the scale, 
that that stuff works. It may not lead to the ultimate decision, but the ultimate decision is usually left with the hiring yeah. manager. But there have been some kooky situations that I've seen. Yeah, you know, I know. I think it's interesting. It was like saying, like you know, like what what would give you the best return on your time, and like you know, and generally speaking, right? Like yeah. because like there's always going to be exceptions to the rules. There, there's exceptions where sometimes the janitor is can also influence it because the janitor just has been there for 35 years and has a great relationship with the, the CEO. I don't know, right? But you can always find some exceptions there. Uh, now, look, yeah, you got jobs and you've hired people at the most admired companies in the world. What, what advice do you have for someone wanting to break into tech and they might not have technical background? Uh, th there's lots. First, as I, I know you talk about a lot, is earn those referrals because referrals will get your resume viewed. Because when you're talking about those best companies in the world, we were getting hundreds, if not thousands of applicants for a role that we would post. So you need to get out of that competition. Secondly, and this is something that I've seen people do terribly wrong, is once you get fortunate enough. So if you're hundreds or thousands of resumes, then the recruiter will talk to about 20 people. Once you get to talk to a human being, you better prepare for that. You better understand what to expect from that recruiter screen so you can get from that recruiter screen to the next stage, which is the yeah. hiring manager. And then you better prepare for that. You better understand what that hiring manager is looking for. You may not know exactly what they're looking for, but the job description gives a lot of good tips of what that hiring manager is looking for. And then when you get to the loops as well, or to the panel interviews, prepare yeah. for that also. So preparation, you can do a lot of preparation. All of this is learnable. Job acquisition, it's a skill. Like I call job acquisition a skill. It's not job search. It's not the job hunt. It is job acquisition. You are trying to acquire a job. And just like you can practice your tennis stroke or just like you can practice shooting a basketball, you can practice and be better at acquiring jobs. Yeah, no, I think I, I think it's so important. I actually think like finding a job, it is a sales process. You know, coming from a sales background, you're, you're following a sales process. There is a sales funnel. You're selling yourself, right? You're not, you are the product in that scenario. And just like you learn sales, you have to learn how to get a job and, and the skills that are required, the relationship building, right? You know, the discovery, the networking, uh, the interviewing, the being able to communicate properly, all of that it becomes really important from the way you communicate on your resume to the way you communicate in networking to the way you communicate in the interview. Um, it's all very, very important. So um, how would you, if you were to break this down into steps, like, hey, like right now, let's say I wanted to go back into the workforce. I wanted to work in the tech industry. Where do I start? So whether, let's use the tech industry because it's an industry that I am very bullish on, even though there have yep. been cutbacks there. The tech industry pays ridiculously well and they're still hiring a lot. The median compensation at Google is $279,000. That's median. That means that like 90,000 people at Google are making north of $280,000. Um, but the steps that I generally tell people is I like acronyms. I call it the growth framework. So first, clearly define your goals. And with those goals, select at least 40 companies that you are going to target. Secondly, realistically assess your strength and leverage those strengths. So if you want to be a product manager, but you've done sales, the hiring manager is not going to... Can I curse sure, on this podcast? The hiring manager is not going to yeah. give a shit that you want to go into product. They care that you've done product. So go in as sales because play to your strength, realistically assess your strength. Third, build that outreach, get those referrals, get someone to get you out of the mix of those hundreds or thousands of resumes. Fourth, work the system. It is a system, it is a game, and you need to know how that game is played so that you can excel at that game. Fifth, train and have tenacity for those interviews. And again, this is, comes to that preparation. They're very preparable, train and have tenacity because you're gonna fail a lot. It's just the nature of the beast. And then six, this is something that people mess up all the time, high impact negotiation. Do not talk about comp, do not, allude to compensation until you get the offer. And at that point, then you begin the high impact negotiation, which will give you more leverage, 
than any time during that interview and will give you more leverage than when you are hired at that company, when you're asking for, it's like when, when you're an asset that that company wants, you have more leverage than when you're there and you're talking to your boss about how you're underpaid. They're not going to give yeah. a crap then. Before you're there. It's so interesting because if you think, you know, if, if you think about it, if you're, you're not going to negotiate when you're applying and you're submitting your application and you're one of 1000 people, you have no leverage. You're one of 1000 people. Fine. You want to, you want to, you want to say that you're worth a million dollars when the reality, the market is not willing to pay more than 200, like get out of here. Bye. But the reality is like, as the, the, the more you go into this, the funnel, right? You go from applicants, a thousand people, first round, like, you know, assessments that might be a hundred people, you know, first round recruiter interviews, that might be 50 people uh, with the hiring team might be 25 people. Like it gets smaller and smaller. And if you, the longer you wait to talk about compensation, the more leverage you have. Now, I think that there is important to have done some research before you even apply to the job to kind of understand the range within this job, right? And you can do a lot of that research at salary.com or Glassdoor, right? To kind of understand the range, but negotiating at the end totally makes sense. Except we teach the same thing at uh, Opni um, and it's super, super important to, 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 to do it. Like don't like, and there's always, there's a way to do it in a way where you're respectful and you're not jeopardizing your offer, but at the same time uh, asking about it and not just taking the first offer they send you. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think it's good to get some outside data points like salary.com comparably is good for the tech industry levels.fyi is good. But I actually looked at the salary range for level nine. That's what I was at Salesforce in New York. And it showed the salary range, the compensation range, 90,000 to 428,000. So first off, it's a huge disparity for level nines at Salesforce in New York. And if I were to believe that 428, I would have never fought for my final paycheck, which was almost $100,000 higher than that. So take those with a grain of salt, realize that that is only people that choose to share that information. And the companies always have more information about Yeah, and they pay for that a lot. They, they, they pay internal resources. So like what we get on Glassdoor and salary.com it's user like like to 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 Alan your point like it's people who decide to put it there right but companies pay internal trades and, and they, internal information to get more accurate data of what the market is willing to pay for those services so they definitely are armed so so I guess my question to you is like how would you find out how, like how did you know that you had a hundred thousand wiggle a hundred thousand dollars of wiggle room there uh, I didn't know I had it I just ignored this stuff externally. So, um, and I, and I also spoke internally to people. So I had trusted friends internally and we would talk about compensation, not yeah. wildly. So, and at some of the companies I worked at, uh, Google did this. I think Facebook did this. I don't think Salesforce did. They had some internal, uh, Google sheets where people would put their income in there. That stuff was actually yeah. more accurate internally than, and yeah. that was not shared externally. So there, you kind of got like, there's like this hidden market of it, but it's also talking to people. It's having open and honest conversations with people. A lot of people are afraid yep. to talk about money and by not being transparent about money. And I'm very transparent. You can look on LinkedIn. I've shared my W2 on LinkedIn. I share that at presentations I give. My last paycheck at, my last compensation at Salesforce was five hundred fifteen thousand three hundred thirty three six three hundred thirty six dollars my W2 is up there. Um, by people not discussing it, yeah. it holds people down. The companies like the fact that we are not transparent with compensation because then they can pay Daniel, yeah. who is a great career coach, and Alan, who's also a great career coach, but you may be making 128000 I may be making 328000 And if I don't tell you that, you'll continue yeah. to be yeah. underpaid. I, I, I... I, I saw an app, it's called Fishbowl. I don't, I've never used it, but I have heard that that's the that app. Uh, you're getting a lot of good, accurate uh, information on, on that app. But yeah, I, I think, you know, I think that's where networking also applies. And when you're, especially when you've been in the industry for long, and, and I would say like, if you're a college student and you think you can negotiate an extra hundred thousand dollars out of college, I would say don't, don't, I think that's on more on the on realistic side, unless you're like a genius. I think the the example that Alan is sharing from his personal perspective is 
he's the farther you're on your career, the more experience that you have, the few fewer people that have the level of experience that Alan has, that gives him that leverage, right? And so like I think it is important that uh, our audience is, is listening and understands that the longer you've been in your career, the more experience uh, you can gain that leverage. But coming out of college, you can still negotiate. You can still get a 10, 20% increase in your pay, but don't expect a, a 200, 300% increase in your pay. Like, I think I just want to make sure like uh, people are not listening. And, and maybe, like I said, there's always exceptions. And Alan, I know that maybe that some you've had some clients that had that, but I just don't want, I don't also don't want people to like, negotiate like if they get offered seventy five thousand to then get hey I'm only taking it if it's three hundred thousand like you're gonna lose the offer. <laughs> oh, I, you're you're spot on, and that's a great point there. I've never, I've only been able to negotiate effectively for more than six figures one time. Um, most of the time, it is in the uh, five, four figures, maybe five figures. So when I've like I help my clients negotiate. The, the average negotiation amount that I can get people up by is 43,000, but I've gotten people up only 5,500, but she was going to, she got an offer for $41,000 from PandaDoc. We got her up to like 46,5. So that is meaningful money for that woman to get that. And we probably could have got her more. She didn't want to push harder, but you always just want to get more. Who cares if it's a hundred thousand, if it's 12,000, if it's 4,000, it's better in your pocket than Saudi Yeah, no, and, and is, that is that's where I, I would agree. Like, I think it's, it's all relative because that you know that hundred thousand dollars is a twenty percent increase of how much you were making, right? Twenty percent increase when you're making uh, fifty thousand dollars is it's a ten thousand dollar increase, right? So like, so you have to think about what that looks like relatively. And I would also say that I saw this. I um, I forgot where I saw this, but it's, it's been shared multiple times. If you can negotiate an extra five thousand dollars at your first job, right, with that compound interest, by the end of your career, that's an extra half a million dollars, right? So it's not just you're making five thousand dollars more, or ten thousand dollars more your first year. Every year moving forward, that's your base, and you get a three percent raise, five percent raise. That ends up adding out and compounding. And, and if you get four hundred one k match, or you get anything on the percentage of that, it's like a six percent salary match on another five thousand dollars. So whatever you can do, get more. There's some great books on it we can talk about, but there are ways to get more. And almost every time that I'm aware of, the company will not offer their max offer yeah. right away. And, and so, let's. I want to talk a little bit more about that. What, like, you know, what are some insights that you know from your so many years of being in the hiring manager perspective, not the HR. You're, you're not, you know, you're not in finance. So like you, you were probably more okay on like giving extra money to your candidates because yes, you were responsible for for your PNL of your team. I get that, but you're still more willing to do that. What other information do you think as a job seeker should know as they're trying to communicate or having an interview with a hiring manager? Like, give you another question here, right? Should I prepare for my interview with the hiring manager the same way I prepare for interviewing with the recruiter? No, definitely not. They're seeking Perfect. different so, information. Yes. So the no, no, I was going to say, yes, yes. tell ahead. me more. So the recruiter, I call mm -hmm. the gatekeeper. Uh, the recruiter is looking for knockout factors because as you said, the recruiter might be talking to 20 candidates or 50 candidates or whatever. And then they do not want to waste the hiring manager's time. So they are looking for reasons to knock you out. You want to, you do not want to be knocked out. You want to get forward to the next step. The recruiter will often be trying to assess if you're out of the market range for compensation. You want to deflect, defer, decline to talk about that. They want to find out if you'll relocate or you'll be in the right location. They want to find out if you meet the criteria that that job description says. They want to know if, uh, I know you work with a lot of international students. Do you need to be sponsored for a visa? Because a company knows that that may or may not knock people out. So they're looking for knockout factors. That's very different than what the hiring manager Before we move assessing. on to the hiring manager, what they're looking for, let's, I want to stay here for a little bit longer because I think this is really interesting. I think people assume getting ready for an interview is getting ready for an interview. And it's not. It's not. It's completely different because you have to understand that as human beings, we're naturally selfish and we all want to do the best in our job and what the recruiter is being measured on and what Alan, the hiring manager is being measured on is completely different. They have different KPIs and the recruiter 
might be measure unfilling roles. It might be just like to your point, the gatekeeper on giving the the top three, four, five candidates to the hiring manager. So the hiring manager doesn't have to talk or review all those applications. So it is super important that you understand that the recruiter, a lot of times don't have as much information about the job. They just have what they learn about the job, either A, from an intake call they had with the hiring manager before the job was open, or because they've been on the team for a long time and they hire a lot of these roles, right? And and they're just checking the box. Like, do you have enough technical skills to do the job? You know, are you in the right city? Are you in the, in the right pay range, right? If, if you need sponsorship, do we sponsor for this role? If we don't, you're automatically rejected. It's nothing personal towards you international students. It's just not worth wasting the time of the hiring manager talking to a candidate that they might fall in love with, but because of HR regulations, we can't do anything about. And so why would we bring him to Allen, right? And so you need to uh, understand what is the recruiter's role, what they're looking for, because then that changes as soon as you get to the hiring manager. So now let's talk about what are the different things that hiring managers are looking for that recruiters might overlook or might not dive into as deeper, as much. Yeah, and, and I heard a good podcast that you had, you recently had, I think, uh, head of recruiting in Netflix mm -hmm. on one of your podcasts, I forget her name. Um, and she talked about how it's important for the recruiter and the hiring manager yep. to have a good partnership. And it is, but it's very rarely done, I found. So I was a, I was a good partner to my recruiting team. So there were most recruiters were pretty good partners with me, but not all. And they're they're bad uh, hiring managers also. So there is often a disconnect. What that hiring manager is looking for, and the hiring manager will often interview you twice, especially at more um, more competitive roles. So it goes recruiter, hiring manager, the loops, and at the loops you'll see the hiring manager again, and they'll be assessing different things there. But at stage two, when you talk to the hiring manager. They were looking for two things predominantly. One, can you do the job? I, as a hiring manager, have this role open. And you, as you mentioned, it could be a backfill. Someone left the team. I need to replace that person. It could be a new, newly created role because it's a big initiative of the company and we're hiring here. Um, th those are pretty much the biggest reasons why their jobs are open. I need you to do that job. So can you give me, in 45 minutes, a semblance of uh of confidence that you can do the job that's number one secondly can i manage you because i'm going to be your boss and if you are difficult if you're a bad communicator if you're impolite if you're not answering the questions if what whatever if, if you don't click unfortunately there's a lot of click there of like do what like one of the things i hate the most is the airport test of oh if i got stuck in the airport for three hours would i be able to hang out with daniel which basically is the antithesis of diversity. But we'll, we'll get to diversity if we want to talk about there. But the hiring manager, looking for two things. Can you do the job? And can yeah. I manage you? And that, that's I also stage. think like, that on top of what you're saying, I think it's important to understand, like, you know, the manager is going to be judged by your work. Like, your manager's boss is not like Mike, like most of them are not going and, and, and individually seeing everyone in Alan's team as an example. So you're going to reflect the manager. And so that's going to play a role in his decision, right? Not just hanging out. Also, you know, Alan talked about is why is the job open, right? Is the, does the person leave? So is it vacant, right? Did they get fired? Did they get promoted? Did they get a transfer? Or is this a new role because it's a new initiative? We're adding headcount to it. I also think that matters in the higher manager's eye because think about it like this. If someone in Alan's team quit, they quit, no two weeks notice, just left today. The, 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 per, the way Alan is fine or interviewing for that replacement might be very different because he might not have the luxury or time to train someone. So he might want somebody to come in right away that can do that. But let's say it's actually the other way. It's, you know, we're, we're interviewing for a role that we're going to need in three months. And Alan has the luxury to bring somebody more junior and be able to train him and develop. And in that scenario, Alan it might be focusing more on the cultural fit. And are they coachable? And so there's different things. So understanding why the role is open, that can also help you on how to prepare for the interview with the hiring manager. Yes, and that's that's great point, Daniel. And that's information you can often assess at the mm -hmm. recruiter screen. And something else you can sometimes assess at the recruiter screen 
is who else is in the competitive set. You can't ask it like that, but you can say, hey, compared to some of the other candidates that you're looking at, where do you think my strengths lie? Where do, where do you have concerns? So you might know that you're fighting against internal candidates or external candidates, and it's a very different way that you should position yourself in those situations. Sometimes you're just going to lose out because as you talk about, like if I as a manager need someone to ramp up quickly, I'm going to probably have a bias for someone internally that knows how the system and the organization works and maybe moving over laterally. Then if I have a little bit more wiggle room and can let someone take a few months no, to ramp no, up. No, I love it. I love it. Alan, look, we obviously can talk forever but we are getting to the end of the podcast. Now, there's a lot of people here and say, hey, Alan, I want more. I want to learn more. How were you able to get jobs into so many amazing companies? If job seekers want to learn more about what you do, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? First way, the way you and I found each other, LinkedIn. It's my favorite platform. It's, uh, it's a really positive platform, especially for job seekers. Secondly, you can go to kadimacareers.com. It's on my shirt here, all one word. K-A-D-I-M-A careers.com. And the third way, actually, and I'm having you on my podcast soon, is come listen to me on the Sick Career Podcast, S-Y-C-K podcast. Love it. Love it. Alan, thank you so much. And if you guys are listening, thank you so much and catch you guys on the next episode. All right. So in today's rant, I want to cover our five-step process to go from a complete stranger to a referral that we use at Opni Careers. And it's very similar to the conversation we have, but I want to walk you through the systematic process and how to navigate this whole conversation. So step number one, find people that have commonality. We talked about that in the, in, in the interview. And I said, the more you have in common, the easier it is to break the ice and start the conversation. Now, step number two, make the first conversation all about them. Don't be rushed to start telling them, hey, my name is Daniel. I'm a marketing student at the University of Central Florida. Instead, ask them questions about their journey, their career, find more commonalities. What you want to do in the first interaction is that you want to let them talk as much as possible. At least 75 to 80% of the talking should be done by the other side. Here's why that's important. Because the more they talk, the more you can listen and understand and find more commonalities. People love to talk about themselves and their journey. So make it about them, their journey, their struggles, their how long they've been in the company, what they like, what they don't like, any advice they can give you. Now, let's talk about step number three. Step number three is when we start converting the company conversation from them to you. I call this opening the feedback loop. So here's the trick. Super, super, super interesting. You ask for a small piece of advice, something that takes little time for them to tell you, but it takes you a couple of hours for you to execute. My favorite uh, piece of advice to ask is what book do you recommend if I want to learn X? Anything, you know, replace X with whatever you want. This is all. It's why I have so many books because when I'm looking to build a relationship with someone and I'm looking to build a skill set and they recommend me a book, I go ahead and read it. I spend a couple of hours reading the book. And what I do after I read it, right, I go back to the person and say, thank you so much for your recommendation. Here's what I re- learned while reading the book and here's how I'm executing it in my life. What that does is one, it allows you to come back and start the conversation again. Two, it proves to the other person that you're someone that truly listens and executes advice, that you're not wasting their time, that you do, that you value them so much that when they gave you advice, you executed it. And this is a big deal because people hate to waste time, especially the more successful they are, the more this is important. Now, because you've already proved to them that you won't waste their time, this takes us to step number four, which is where you start and ask for a resume review. So you're going to continue this loop of asking advice, executing, asking advice, executing. And so the next piece of advice that I would then do is, hey, do you mind reviewing my resume? I found a job at Disney as a software engineer that I think I'll be a good fit. But before I submit my application, I would love to forget your thoughts on my resume. Now, the reason why this is so ninja and so clutch and so important is you have nothing to lose but a lot to gain. If your resume is perfect, they're going to be super impressed and they're going to want to refer you. If your resume needs help, then they can give you feedback and they know that you're going to execute it and that's going to help, help, help that's going to want, that's going to want 
to help you even more. So then you go and take your resume, you fix, you, you fix whatever they suggest that you give it back to them and say, Hey, thank you so much. I made the changes. Now this takes us to step number five and how you ask for the referral without asking for the referral. Now that they've seen your resume, they've seen your experience, they see that you execute, you then ask them, hey, thank you so much for your resume. I fixed it. Here it is. I completed all the changes. Now, before I go ahead and apply to the job online, is there anybody you recommend I connect with or speak to to get my application visibility? Look, I understand how competitive it is to get a job at Disney or X company and would love your advice on how to do this. Again, so this becomes the third time you ask for advice. The first two times you ask, you've executed. So they know that they that they, if they give you advice or if they refer to you, that, they, that you're going to execute, that you're going to make them look good. Plus, they've already seen your resume, so they already know that you're qualified for the job. What happens most of the time here, they're either A, refer to you, B, send your resume directly to the hiring manager, or C, give you advice on who you should be networking with to get that connection or the referral. Look, this strategy works. I've been using this for about eight years, and it works as long as you follow the steps. Don't try to skip them. Uh, focus, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, if you find this helpful, give us a like, share this with one of your friends, and subscribe to the podcast. If you want to learn more about the strategies that we use, on Opni and how to help you get a job, definitely hit the link below. Learn more about Opni. We would love to learn how we can help you. And I'll see you guys later. Thank you so much for listening.